Hi everyone, this is Sam with Wine News in 5. Today I'm going to give you an update on an ecstasy spiked champagne case that's been ongoing since 2022, briefly cover flooding in the Rhone Valley, the Castel Group's new acquisition, Australia's wine sales to China, and then I'm going to bit, get a bit nerdy with two new technologies in winemaking, one that can take the place of sulfur dioxide and the other that can condense CO2 from winery fermentations to be used later in the winemaking process which is my favorite piece of news in six months. Starting with ecstasy spiked champagne. Back in February, 2022, eight people in the German state of Bavaria went to dinner, ordered a three liter bottle of Moet and Chandon Ice Imperial, which is packaged in this uh, glass bottle with an opaque white plastic covering. Presumably cheers, took a sip, and within minutes they were foaming at the mouth and convulsing with what was later discovered to be MDMA poisoning. One diner died in the restaurant, the other seven were rushed to the hospital and recovered. A few days later, four people in the Netherlands opened a three liter bottle of Ice Imperial at home and were hospitalized with the same symptoms. Now, liquid MDMA is not sparkling. It's reddish brown in color, it smells like aniseed, and it would absolutely have been visible when poured into wine glasses. All reports confirm that the liquid in these bottles looked nothing like champagne, but, Nonetheless, it was consumed, one person died, 11 people were hospitalized. The dose in the bottles was around a thousand times greater than what a drug user would generally take. Investigation into the incidents found that both bottles were ordered from the same website. Then last November, a Polish man was arrested for storing the bottles and became a suspect in the case. Last week, investigators arrested a Dutch man, charging him with possession and distribution of the MDMA that went into the bottles. Dutch news site ADNL reports that he is also accused of gang-related drug trafficking, as well as murder and injury through negligence. Before you write off Imperial Ice, though, this was two years ago. There have been no further reports of these bottles being in circulation. Moy issued a recall on the lots that had been tampered with. The man responsible was just arrested and there seems to be no further danger. But if you ever pour champagne, that doesn't look right. I'd send it back. On to flooding in the Rhone Valley. Just after James Lother MW left the Rhone where he was preparing a report on the 2023 vintage for us, San Joseph and the Ardèche experienced heavy rainfall and flooding. Although harvest was over by the time of the rains, the week of October 14th, the rain damaged vineyards and flooded cellars. Winemaker Brian Delay of Domaine Brian Delay in Conjou told Vitisphere that he had lost a thousand square meters of vines and that repairs would be laborious. On to the Castel Group's new acquisition. The Castel Group in France is the largest wine company, producing somewhere between 600 and 650 million bottles every year. The company captures around 16% of the country's market share. It acquired its first champagne brand, Négociant Maison Mallard, on October 12th. Mallard has been distributed by the Castel Group's wine retail chain, Nicola, and supplies champagne for the chain's own brand. Now, if you haven't heard about Maison Mallard, you're not alone. 98% of their 20 million a year revenues are generated from the French market. But this is big news for France. On to Australia's wine sales to China. Wine Australia released their 2024 fiscal year export report on October 22nd. The report shows that in the last 12 months, Australian wine exports have increased by 34% in value to 2.39 billion Australian dollars and 7% in volume to 643 million liters. This is the highest by value and volume that exports have achieved since 2021. The surge is due to China lifting its tariffs on Australian wine in March of this year. Excluding China, exports to other countries have remained steady in value at 1.78 billion Australian dollars with a 3% decline in volume. Finally, super geeky things, starting with a potential replacement for sulfur dioxide. Firstly, the reason this is exciting is because right now, sulfur dioxide is the only compound we have that is both an antimicrobial, keeps bacteria and yeast from spoiling your wine, and an antioxidant, keeps oxygen from turning your wine brown and lifeless. There are other products that can do one or the other, but really there's nothing as efficient, effective, and can still be added to your wine if it's organic, as long as it's below 100 parts per million and you're not in the US. But many consumers and some wine ma winemakers are still anti-SO2, and there may now be an alternative. 
On October 21st, Vitasphere published a story on a new product called Chest Wine. The product was created by researchers at the Polytechnic Institute of Braganza in Portugal, who filed a patent in 2017 to use tannins from male chestnut flowers as a wine preservative. Chestnut polyphenols are antimicrobial, and the high levels of tannins scour both free and dissolved oxygen. In 2019, Philippe Ortega, a wine consultant who had successfully trialed the product for the university, took over the patent and launched a company called Tree Flowers Solutions. That company finalized their formulation in June. They changed it from a tea formula to a powder, and then they verified that the product met the requirements of the International Organization of Vine and Wine, the OIV, and organic certifiers. I think this is awesome, not because I'm anti-SO2, but because more organic options made from natural sources are always welcome. And while SO2 doesn't bother me as a drinker, working with it in its pure state in the winery is admittedly pretty unpleasant. So I'm looking forward to trying a chestnut tannin stabilized wine. Last, but certainly not least, a machine that can capture CO2 from fermenters and condense it. As most of you probably know, when wine ferments, it releases loads of CO2. What perhaps fewer of you know is that almost every winery buys CO2 to flush tanks and hoses and protect the cap of fresh unfermented grape must and or finished wine. This purchased CO2 is, generally speaking, manufactured as a byproduct of oil refineries and fertilizer plants. It's refined to food grade, highly compressed, and then it's used as a snow sprayed out of a gas canister, or it comes in the form of dry ice. Unfortunately, the CO2 produced during alcoholic fermentation of wine can't be used for most winery needs because it's too dilute. Still, it has always seemed a shame to me that a process that uses CO2 as an input and releases it as an output isn't able to be made cyclical, which is why I yelled at my computer like a football fanatic when I read on Vitisphere that a wine cooperative in France, Vigneron de Tutiac, have just finished trialing a machine produced by W Platform that's capable of capturing the CO2 from fermentations, filtering it to 99% pure food grade CO2 and compressing it 100 bars. The cooperative buys about 50 tons worth of CO2 a year at a cost of around 30,000 euros. With a production of 50,000 hectoliters, they'd be able to produce 240 tons of CO2 as snow, less as dry ice, but still plenty to be autonomous. W Platform proposed to charge the co-op 130,000 euros for the CO2 box, the compressor, the dry ice pellet machine, and storage tanks, or 100,000 euros with rented tanks. The co-op has yet to decide if it's worth the upfront investment. W Platform, I know some people in the US who would really love your number. That's all for this episode of The Wine News. If you enjoyed this newscast and you'd like to see it continue, please subscribe to chancesrobinson.com. And if you have breaking news in your area, please email me at news at chancesrobinson.com. Thanks.